Iskander Raymond. I am the Senior Fellow for International Relations here at the Pell Center. And it's my pleasure to welcome you to the first panel discussion of 2018 entitled Tomorrow's Battlefield, the Future Military Competition. So it's been a busy past few months uh, for members of the defense community with a number of important framing documents having been released uh, from the White House's National Security Strategy to the Nuclear Posture Review and the Unclassified Summary of the National Defense Strategy. All of these documents have been poured over and scrutinized. Some, such as the Nuclear Posture Review, have proven somewhat controversial, while others, such as the National Defense Strategy, have been relatively well received. I'd argue, however, that there is one uh, common thread or core theme that undergirds all three documents, and that is the resurgence of great power competition and the urgent need for the United States national security establishment to adapt to an environment characterized by turmoil, shifting balances of power, and increasingly rapid cycles of disruptive technological change. Now, of course, a cynic might argue that since the end of the Cold War, US defense planners have been chafing at the reins in their attempts to move away from the uh, depressing game of transcontinental whack-a-mole that is counterterrorism, only to be dragged back in time again into the weeping sore that is the Middle East. The fiscally responsible who worry about the soaring national debt and fret about matching resources with objectives could certainly also ask the question of how the US can afford a sustained competition of Moscow and Beijing while also managing the growing sub-regional threats posed by North Korea and Iran, along with many other commitments. How also can the US military, as well as its core allies, maintain their competitive edge while preparing for both high-intensity and low-intensity warfare? These are all legitimate questions that would no doubt make for a fascinating topic of discussion, but that's not uh, what we're going to be doing this evening. Instead, what I thought might be more intellectually stimulating is for all of us to take a look at what's happening behind the headlines and the day-to-day -day budgetary and bureaucratic squabbles and go on a brief journey along the technological frontiers of today's military competition. Naturally, it's long been a common conceit of military strategists to believe that with the advent of some future game-changing technology, the very character of war will also undergo some fundamental shift. History has also shown us, however, that there is a danger in not fully anticipating or in underestimating the pace of technological advancement. To paraphrase the Italian Douay, victory smiles upon those who anticipate the changes in the character of war not upon those who wait to adapt themselves after they occur. At various critical times in US history, American leaders have launched initiatives that sought to draw on this nation's great reservoir of technological know-how and capacity for innovation in order to offset serious and looming threats. During the Eisenhower administration and the so-called first offset, there was the New Look defense policy, which put an emphasis on countering Soviet conventional superiority with long-range bombers, missiles, and a larger nuclear arsenal. During the 1970s, under the Carter administration, there was an effort to develop and integrate a whole new suite of technologies, ranging from stealth platforms to precision-guided weapons that was then pursued under the Reagan administration. And then finally, under the Obama administration, we bore witness to the unveiling of the so-called third offset strategy, which sought to lessen the growing threats to US power projection by leveraging advantages in areas such as undersea warfare, unmanned systems, and cyber and electronic warfare. So, so with this in mind, that I convened this terrific trio of panelists for our discussion tonight. You'll find their, their full bios in the leaflets that were handed out, but let me briefly introduce them all the same. Uh, Victoria Sampson, who will be discussing the state of competition in the so-called second space age, is the Washington Office Director of the Secure World Foundation. She will be followed by Whitney McNamara, who is currently an analyst at the Center for Strategic and Budgetary Assessments, where I myself spent two rewarding years from 2013 to 2015. And she will be talking about electronic warfare and competition in the electromagnetic spectrum. And last but not least, Professor Jackie Schneider from the US Naval War College will be talking about ongoing developments in robotics and unmanned systems. All three speakers have been doing some really fascinating cutting edge research in their fields, and we're very lucky to have them with us here tonight. You'll probably also notice in the course of the discussion that cyber threats and capabilities bleed into all three areas or domains of conflict discussed this evening. Uh, so each speaker will speak for about 10 minutes. And as we have three speakers today, I may forego asking my usual follow-up questions and directly open it up to the audience so that you folks can get all your questions in. Uh, so without further ado, Victoria, the floor is yours. Thank you. 
There you go. Hello everyone, my name is Victoria Sampson. I'm the Washington Office Director of the Secure World Foundation. I'd like to thank Dr. Raymond for asking me to speak here, and this is my first visit. Um, it's a gorgeous campus, very excited to be here. Um, I'm going to be talking about um, tomorrow's battlefield, looking at the competition in military space. Um, just to give you a sense of my organization's background, um, I work for the Secure World Foundation. We're a private operating foundation that focuses on the long-term sustainable use of outer space. We come at it from an international cooperative approach the idea that you want space to be usable for everyone over the long term. Um, and just a note to Benny that this briefing is um, entirely compiled from public and unclassified sources. Oops. Start my timer so I can be good. Okay, so why is this important to stability and security? I think oftentimes when people think about space and they think about any kind of instability, they look at weapons. And in my opinion, I think it's more helpful to talk about what is stable to the space domain. Can we get access to those resources on orbit if and when we want to? Um, and so we have an increasing number and diversity in new actors. Both, um, you know, space used to be bipolar, um, just really the U.S. and Soviet Union, and now you have over 60 countries that have uh, space assets. We have um, new actors coming online. It used to be there's a high cost of access to space. And now, pretty much, um, there are junior highs launching CubeSats off the space station. And you have new countries entering space. And I don't want to say this is a criticism, but any time you have change, you have instability. And so the question is, how do you make it so that sp space is stable and usable over the long term? Um, in my opinion, I think stability relies on the um, stability rests on the reliable and predictable access to space. Um, and here, I'd be remiss if I didn't do my moment. We put out a book, Handbook for New Actors in Space, the idea of welcome to the space club. Here's these things you need to know. What we have in three sections. One is on the international legal regime. There's this thing called the Outer Space Treaty. You might want to be aware of it. The thing talking about national regulatory issues you need. Um, if you're going to be broadcasting, you need someone to regulate spectrum. And then on-orbit operations, what are the best practices? It's free on our website. I brought a few copies out front. And um, if you have any interest in it, please come approach me afterwards. But the concern is, of course, when you have satellite capabilities disappear, people don't always understand. We kind of think of it as we have complete 100% situational awareness. We don't. Um, a satellite stops working, you don't know necessarily if it's because someone deliberately interfered with it, because someone screwed up and you're manufacturing it, because there was a solar flare, you just don't know. Um, I don't know if you guys heard about the um, intelligence satellite, Zuma, that was um, um, launched a couple weeks ago and then was lost. And the question was, did it go into the ocean? Did it go somewhere else? Was it secretly hiding behind another satellite? You know? And um, what really cracks me up about the whole situation is that a, 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 a guy in his backyard with a telescope said, well, I want to find that satellite. He, did, he found a NASA satellite that they lost track of in 2005. So I mean, and they're like, oh, that's where that was. And so they're like, oh, it's, it stopped broadcasting. And they didn't really think to look for it. So I mean, th there's just so much we don't know about space. And if you're, and that's OK, you know, in the NASA circumstance, they, rebooted it, it's working out fine. But I mean, if you're in a time of increased hostilities, that could lead to really serious consequences on the ground. So I'm not going to read all this. Um, this PowerPoint will be available on my organization's website. But just to give you a sense, um, just recently, actually last week, the Director of Natu National Intelligence um, gave his worldwide threat assessment where he talks about both Russia and China continue to pursue, pursue anti-satellite or ASAT weapons as a means to reduce U.S. and allied military effectiveness. Um, we assess that if a future conflict were to occur involving Russia and China, um, either country would justify attacks against U.S. and allied satellites. Uh, Russia and Chinese destructive satellites will probably reach an initial operation capability in the next few years. And the last part, which I think is interesting, is they talk about uh, their ability to launch, quote, experimental satellites that conduct sophisticated on-orbit activities. Um, some technologies with peaceful applications, such as satellite inspection, refueling, repair, can also be used against adversary spacecraft. And for space, that's a real concern. Uh, uh, technology is technology. Um, but the question is, what is your intent? And that's often difficult to, um, to um, project. So looking at, and so what I'm going to do is kind of go over really quickly, in the six minutes I have left, uh, really quickly uh, kind of around the world counter space capabilities and some of the things that I think are really and truly big threats to the sp stability of the space domain. Um, <clears throat> Russia had a bit of a hard time after the Cold War ended, but they seem to be resurgent. They are, appear to be recapitalizing some of the Cold War era capabilities. Um, they've had multiple flight tests recently of their ballistic missile defense, or ASAT missile. Um, they've done a couple demonstrations of rendezvous and proximity operations. Um, that's basically when you get a satellite up close to another satellite. And that can be for good reasons, whether you're going up to maybe refuel, 
or it could be for another reason if you're going up to inspect. Of course, if you don't know the other satellite, having someone else's satellite come up to yours can be a little bit um, unsettling. Um, and you know, they had some Russian satellites going up to a U.S. commercial satellite player at geostationary orbit, which is 36,000 kilometers up. And the, the U.S. commercial actor was very concerned about what the Russians were doing and why they were so close to their satellite. Um, but, and I think, um, as Dr. Raymond mentioned, there is a lot of uh, electronic warfare that comes up for space, and I think the other speakers will be discussing this as well. The Russians obviously have um, electronic warfare and cyber capabilities. There have been a lot of reports of them jamming things in the Ukraine and also from Syria. Uh, China um, comes up a lot when we talk about possible threats to the U.S. in terms of military capabilities. Um, they're on path to develop a full spectrum of space capabilities. Um, and these are things that are for national prestige, you know, the Taiko knots and their own version of the space station, two things that are like using space for the industrial base. They've got their own version of GPS, the Baidu constellation that they're creating. And then they are looking at possibly developing capabilities that could have counter space efforts. And that's the same thing. It sounds like I'm being very, um, I don't want to say one or the other, but it's hard to say. You know, they're testing things that could provide a capability. It could not. We don't know. They're not super transparent. China transparency does not no normally go well together. Uh, but typically, they have refrained from outright military aggression, although they, you know, they've done some things in their local area that has been seen and thre threatening. So it's kind of hard to say what their true intent is. Uh, but then, of course, this is not happening in a vacuum. The United States has demonstrated multiple capabilities of um, anti-satellite or some sort of counter space capabilities. Um, we've been doing a t close approach and rendezvous um, in both LEO, that's low Earth orbit, about anything 2,000 kilometers and down, and geostationary orbit, as long as we've been doing technologies that could lead to co-orbital ASAT capabilities. So we've done this. We've been doing it for years. We have no acknowledged program to develop a co-orbital weapon system, let me be very clear. There's no specific program that's unclassified that we know of. It doesn't mean that we're not possibly working on technologies or that can provide that kind of capability. We just know for sure. Um, but the U.S. has definitely demonstrated a basic durant ASAT um, capability. In 2008, the United States shot down a satellite with one of its missile defense interceptors. Uh, we were very open and clear at the time. We said, hey, the satellite's out of control. Um, we use one of our missile, our um, sea-based missile defense interceptors to do it. In theory, we changed the software and then we changed it right back afterwards. Um, who knows what we actually did, though? And um, perhaps interestingly enough, this happened a year after China actually shot down one of their own satellites. So coincidence, possibly. Um, one of the things I, I'm really interested in India. I think they're a fascinating place, and people don't really focus on their space program, but they're doing things, and they've been doing things for decades. They've had a space program since 1962. Historically, it's been focused on civil applications, but over the past couple of years, they've been looking at military applications um, because of concerns about their neighbors, um, specifically China, but you know, the things going on in Pakistan, they want space capabilities as an enabler for the military. Um, India has been working on a missile defense system, and there are multiple quotes from various India officials talking about how they have the building blocks for an ASAC capability. They don't want one, but if they needed one, they could do it. Now, whether that's just being sold to the public to justify the program, or if it's something they think they honestly be able to use, I'm not sure, but they've never tasted, tested their missile defense in an anti satellite capacity. Um, and then uh, has growing space situation awareness, the idea of being able to track things on orbit, that's kind of important if you're going to be hitting things, right? You need to know where the, your targets are. Um, India has a limited but growing um, SSA capability. In my opinion, though, I think they're unlikely to create an official counter space program, uh, both because it goes against um, what their interest is, but also they launch a lot of other countries' satellites. They've invested in their own satellites. I don't think they'd want to mess up their um, area of their market where they're making a lot of money launching other people's satellites. Um, really quickly, Iran has a very limited space program, but they're only like they have the capability to build on orbit direct ISAT um, weapons. I think they've launched four satellites on their launch vehicles at pretty low orbits. They have not demonstrated any kind of tracking capability to allow them to target another satellite. But they sure can jam, and they do this a lot. Um, so that's something that they can do. Uh, DPR, uh, uh, DPRK, um, they may be able to do some limited direct descent ASATs with their um, missile defenses, but they've never actually tested it. And, it, and actually, if you go back and read um, statements by officials in DPRK, counter space has not come up at all, like at all for their space program. They just talk about peaceful use, we have the right to launch some satellites, we have the right to develop our things. They don't talk about from counter space capacity. But again, they do a lot of GPS interference. <laughs> 
Um, and then if you work on space issues, one of the common concerns people have is that a country without a lot of space assets would want to put a nuke on orbit and then do an EMP. Um, in theory, I guess North Korea could do that, but it would have to be a really big nuclear weapon. They've not shown that same capability. I would say it's unlikely, but it's one of those high impact, low probability sort of events. And then um, really quickly, I'll be going through this uh, because I think my other uh, panelists will be discussing this. People tend to like to focus on threats to the space environment. They think of weapons because, you know, Star Wars makes a great visual, right? Um, but that's something that could happen down the line. But cyber attacks, electronic warfare is happening now. It's seen as much more usable. It's seen as not easy to track. And um, it's seen as something we can do. And so I think people tend to think, okay, way off, need to worry about these space threats. No, these are happening now. There's maybe not the ones you like to think about. Um, and these are destabilizing because the laws of armed conflict for space are really unclear. How do you do proportionality? How do you do distinction? How do you um, work on any of those types of issues? We haven't figured it out yet, but people are doing it. Countries are doing it. Um, because I've already reached time, I'm just going to go very quickly, but we're already seeing interference with satellites. Um, this is one of the things satellite companies don't like to discuss because they see it as losing possible market share. It looks bad if you admit to a cyber attack, but it's one of those things where they have to coordinate on. Um, and then with new entrants to space, you have new entry points for attacks. So this could be happening more and more. And then uh, a lot of us uh, used to be you had commercial satellites and military satellites and civil satellites, <coughs> but now you have launch vehicles launching payloads for all. And so it's really hard to distinguish what's going to be for which. And so that allows them, um, it's hard to, allows for more opportunities for attack and it's more difficult to ensure resiliency. And then just one other thing, a lot of these satellites are old. You know, these satellites, especially for the U.S. military, it takes maybe 10 years to actually get a satellite. And then you put it up there and it's good for 20 years. So a lot of the satellites for the National Security Establishment, they're working on a technology that's 10, 15, 20, 30 years old. Now, think about your computer. How often do you updates for that? These satellites, how do, you can't do updates for them. And in some ways that's good because they were built before a lot of these holes were there. On the other hand, you can't really strengthen them either. So it's kind of concerning. Um, and then again, now with newer satellites, we have increased use of commercial off-the-shelf <coughs> technologies. That means you do have possibly openings for attacks. And then finally, um, with new uses of the space, that can cause more destabilizing. Um, you have space resource utilization, the idea of asteroid mining. Uh, people always get real excited about that. It's not happening yet. One of the companies that wants to do it, they just fired 70 of their people, so who knows what's going to go on with that. But there are concerns. I work a lot with international discussions on these issues. And there are a lot of concerns by other countries that they're going to be left behind. You know, they hear about, you know, if you mine an asteroid, you can get a quadrillion dollars, a quadrillion dollars worth of stuff. They look at that. You know, these are countries that were, they were left out of the riches of colonization, you know, and so they're very concerned about these space assets are going to be gone and won't be there, and so that's kind of destabilizing. As I said, rendezvous and proximity operations, the dual-use nature can make your intent murky, and so it's difficult to know what's stable there. And then finally, um, there are a lot of satellites in orbit, and there's even more debris that we're tracking in orbit. Uh, the U.S. military is tracking over 20,000 pieces of debris. That's anything larger than 10 centimeters in diameter or a softball. And so the concern is, at some point, you need to get that stuff down because it can be very destabilizing. You have debris crashing into each other at the high speeds on orbit. Um, it can create a lot more. If you've ever seen the movie Gravity, a little poetic license, but you, you get the sense. Uh, and so the idea is, okay, well, we'll just take the debris down. You need active debris removal. Uh, the concern is, of course, um, anything that can take down debris can also be used to take down a satellite, perhaps. So conclusions, um, there's a reluctance currently use kinetic force against ASATs. I would almost say there's a norm against it, but it doesn't mean that they're not using cyber electronic attacks. But we need to start having these sort of discussions because counter space efforts are being considered and possibly the technical capabilities being developed internationally. Um, space actors need to think about how can they continue access to their capabilities? How do you ensure resilience of your assets? Uh, that's a big, in the U.S. military right now, that's a hot, um, vocab, they talk a lot, how do you deal with resiliency? Um, I'm not sure what the right answer for that is, but a lot of people are thinking about it. And then in terms of looking at how do you do appropriate responses to possible threats to your space capabilities, the idea of having norms of behavior, where you talk about what's the rules of the road, how do you be a responsible operator? Handbook for new actors in space, one way of doing it. But also talking about how you improve space situational awareness, that's another way to do it as well. So I think I've gone over my time by a little bit, so I'll stop now. Um, I look forward to your questions, and thank you for your time. Great, thank you. So my name is Whitney McNamara, and I'll be talking about the electromagnetic spectrum. 
And I'll thank you in advance. Typically, the electromagnetic spectrum is kind of seen as like the ugly redheaded stepchild of the military. So thanks for in advance for letting me convince you that it is actually as important. Um, so I would argue that the most consequential trend in 21st century warfare is the increasing role um, and influence of information. And since the electromagnetic spectrum kind of underpins this information battle space, it's going to be an area that is increasingly important in military competition. And I'd go as far as to say that whoever is able to achieve superiority in the spectrum will heavily sway, if not determine, the outcome of our next war. So even though the United States has been operating in the EMS uh, for over 75 years, our ability to do so now is threatened because the EMS is much more contested and congested. Um, one part of that, obviously, is the proliferation of commercial devices and technology that take up space on the spectrum. The other part of it, though, is a major paradigm shift in war fighting that is moving away um, from large-scale conflicts of attrition to lower-intensity conflicts in which um, information is more important than mass. <coughs> and, um, of course, information has always been a central part of war fighting, but Russian and Chinese leaders in particular have been saying for decades that in future wars, the center of gravity is going to be information, and they've been planning accordingly for decades. And I'd argue that Russia and China are ahead of the United States in advancing strategies that reflect this changing dynamic, which is really the basis of Russia's new generation warfare strategy and China's informationized warfare strategy. And these strategies aren't just advancing uh, their own ability to operate in the spectrum, but they're also meant to diminish our ability too. So, and this is really meant to chip away at our dependence on our precision guided complex and our C4 ISR networks. And these are, you know, billion dollar plus um, information infrastructure that's really been the basis of a lot of our military superiority. And one of our biggest military uh, advantages for the past 20 years is our ability to build a high fidelity operational picture you know, quickly. Um, and our ability to do that is really being chipped away at these new informationized strategies. So ultimately, what Russia and China are doing is using low intensity aggression uh, that's supported by EMS ops and protected by long-range weapon and sensor networks. Um, and that really reduces the U.S. ability to, you know, build this operational picture and then exploit it. And it really prevents the U.S. from even responding to this kind of aggression proportionately. So the strategies that Russia and China use explicitly state that the EMS is the central part of how you can influence your uh, adversary's decision-making process. So rather than just accelerating their own decision cycle or OODA loop, they're actually seeking to disrupt and paralyze ours. Um, and that's either by shaping our informational picture, manipulating our perception of the environment, or altering the real environment. So we either, the United States, make a bad decision, or we can't make any decision because we don't have enough information, or we're not sure of the fidelity of the information that we do have. So even though this kind of deception and manipulation of the informational picture would be obviously catastrophic in a phase three conflict. Um, our adversaries do not have to escalate it to that level because they are able to achieve their political military objectives below the threshold of a, con like a conventional conflict. Um, and what we call, I guess we're calling the gray zone. So, and both Russia and China have demonstrated success in this, obviously, Russia and Crimea, and then later broad, more broadly in Ukraine, and China in the South and East China Seas. And of course, the method of expanding their sphere of influence is increasingly attractive because they can achieve their object objectives with less risk um, because it's carefully calibrated to be below the threshold of, that would elicit a US response. It also is with less cost, obviously, than a conventional conflict and most of the time um, with less attribution since they use proxy or power military forces. It's also a very attractive option for them because the United States really lacks um, a proportional response in this space. If we use physical force <coughs> to defend against these types of low intensity campaigns, we would be perceived as the aggressor, not just by our adversary, but perhaps even the international community. And our responses are further limited by the fact that Russia and China now have long-range sensor and weapon networks um, that enable this approach and they protect their, these low-intensity operations. So this approach obviously gives China and Russia escalation dominance and really um, diminishes our ability to orient and decide, which is exactly their objective.
It also means we lose our ability to conduct small strike while still remaining vulnerable to small strike ourselves. Um, a contested EMS means that we're not able to communicate and sense. And see, uh, since EMS ops in the gray zone are small scale and ambiguous, it's really hard to justify a long range strike or a large scale attack. Um, and lastly, these long range sensors and weapon networks denies us the persistent ISR that we've been really used to in the Cold War. So now that we've returned to great power competition, the same <coughs> um, abilities that we enjoyed in the past, we no longer do. Um, an, an example in China's current gray zone operations, uh, really leaves the U.S. and allied leaders with two very unsavory options. You can either confront low-intensity aggression under the threat of China's long-range sensor and weapons, or you can military suppress these networks, but then, of course, you're doing it at a high risk of escalating the conflict. So we're unable to respond proportionately and without escalating, and this obviously places the U.S. at a disadvantage in this long-term competition with these great powers. And one thing that's important to understand, too, is how Russia and China view this information space and the electromagnetic spectrum versus how the United States views it. So Russian and Russia and China's view of information warfare is holistic. So they view weaponized narratives on social media, C4 ISR, even investment in decoys as kind of one continuum of the information space that can help um, disrupt or influence the adversary's decision. The United States, on the other hand, we have a very um, stovepipe approach into a series of disparate communities and organizations, whether that's EW, SIG and ELINT, um, Cyber, ISR. And this fragmentation has really hurt our ability to understand what Russia and China have been doing in this space. And then in turn, of course, it really prevents us from being able to respond to it or meet them at this place. So we acknowledged decades ago, just like Russia and China, that um, information was going to be central to future war. Unfortunately, um, with the advent of the internet, cyber quickly became the face of informationized warfare to the detriment of spectrum operations. And it reflects in our current discourse. If, if you read an article about informationized warfare, or you go to a conference about informationized warfare, we're either talking about two things, cyber, um, or weaponized narratives and the use of social media. And those are both extremely important topics to be talking about. Um, but if we're talking about information, you know, the spectrum is the most accessible and vulnerable medium in this kind of complex network of information exchange. So what we're working on now at my organization um, is just saying what would it look like if the electromagnetic spectrum was a warfighting domain similar to air or land or sea. And that would enable us to start preparing to compete in this space, which we are not doing so successfully at this time. Since the Department of Defense still kind of views EMS as a utility or a tactical one-off use, um, we haven't really figured out what it looks like to maneuver in this space or to achieve superiority in that space. What does that look like? How long can we hold it? The who, what, where, when, and how? And since we haven't done that, there are gaps in requirements, training, and personnel. Um, which leaves us just as unprepared as, as we have been. So for the foreseeable future, you know, our adversaries are going to continue to pursue these informationized strategies unless we can develop um, a more effective response. And the electromagnetic uh, spectrum, I'd argue, is where that response should occur. Great. Thank you. That's terrific. All right. So now I get to talk about... Um, Unmanned systems. Um, so what do we think about when we think about unmanned systems? We think about predators. We think about drones. And these have this sci-fi kind of characteristics to them. They sound futuristic. They sound new. They sound maybe scary. Um, but in reality, what we're really talking about when we're talking about unmanned systems are the same things that the rest of the panelists are talking about which is the removal of the human being from the physical battlefield. Taking the human being from physically touching one another to create some sort of effect, and instead using machines as proxies. And increasingly in our technological world, that distance between the human being that is combating one another um, is expanding with the advent of new technologies. But in reality, this quest to remove the human being from the battlefield is not futuristic or new. 
This is something that we as human beings have done for as long as we could develop weapon systems, whether it's the spear or the longbow, the cannon, the machine gun, the aircraft. And these are all technological developments that have come along and taken the man from the battlefield. And at each instance, we as human beings said, aha, now I can get somebody else to do what I want them to do, and I don't have to risk human life. And almost invariably, as the stakes get higher, these weapons um, have a kind of a tit-for-tat development cycle, and we find that man comes back to the forefront of existential conflict. Now, in modern warfare, are we moving away from this weapons tit-for-tat development? Are we moving to the future with the future of all warfare being increasingly long distance? Well, with the advent of the microprocessor in the 1960s and the 1970s, it sure has started to look that way. So when the microprocessor came upon the defense and technology scene, we saw this as a technology that would allow us to revolutionize the distance that we could uh, coerce our adversaries. That meant that we could use ballistic missile technology with amazing precision. That then led to what we're now calling in the defense community as the second offset, which was the development of precision-guided munitions and really the type of warfare that we saw during the Iraqi war, which allowed us to um, exert extraordinary conventional dominance with very little human being risk to nation states that were able to effectively leverage this kind of long-range technology. So today when we talk about unmanned systems, we often think about drones, but in reality we've been seeing this progression over the last few decades in a lot of different types of technologies. Cruise missiles, Air-to-air -air missiles, I mean, when we shoot air-to-air -air missiles off jets, we're talking at ranges where these weapons can be autonomous at you know, 50, 60, 70 nautical miles. I mean, these are beyond visual range weapons. And um, the Aegis Defense System, which is the system that's on uh, Navy ships that potentially can shoot down ballistic missile defenses, ballistic missiles. Um, Patriot batteries, which are, um, surface-to-air missiles that are also used to shoot down aircraft and ballistic missiles. Um, all of space is unmanned, and we've been putting those um, up in space for a long time. And now increasingly, cyber weapons are a really good example of the drive towards unmanned and autonomous technology. Um, in the United States, I think we've talked a lot about the role that unmanned airstrikes drones have played in foreign policy decision making. And between 2008 and 2016, the Obama administration authorized 506 unmanned uh, airstrikes in Pakistan, Yemen, and Somalia. That was 10 times the number authorized by uh, President Bush. And in his first year in office, President Trump has also used unmanned airstrikes in Libya, Syria, Yemen, Afghanistan, Pakistan, Iraq. Somalia and Niger. And um, the point is, they're being used quite often, and we hear about them all the time. Recently, there was um, uh, an unmanned, um, I don't know if you want to call them swarm, but it was a series of commercial drones that were used to attack uh, a Russian airbase. So here's where the interesting puzzle comes in. So if you go and look on all the headlines, say, oh my goodness, the Russians shot down drones. Wow. And then they show a picture of a Russian aircraft with all sorts of damage on it. And you think, oh my god, they bought drones from Walmart and they sent them up into space and, and now the Russian aircraft are being taken over. This is craziness. So here's the, the puzzle. The damage on that aircraft was not from the drones. In fact, the Russians easily shot down those, that swarm of crazy drones. That damage was from a really unsophisticated technology, mortars. So why do we have this fascination with unmanned systems? What is it that captures our imagination? Because it's not just the imagination of the American people. It's the imagination of defense technocrats. It's the imagination of the people who are buying the weapons that we stock our future wars with. So this has been a really interesting puzzle for me to look at what drives our desire to invest in unmanned technologies? When you look at um, the third offset technology, the third offset strategy, unmanned is identified, now it's moving towards autonomy and artificial mm -hmm. intelligence, is identified as the pivotal technology for defeating adversaries like China and Russia. 
And when you listen to the, ver the vocabulary that they use, it's all about the historical inevitability of unmanned warfare. Um, the director of tactical technology at DARPA argued that um, we had no choice but to go to unmanned systems because it is the natural evolutionary path. Um, Department of Defense futurist Peter Singer says, this is the, the future of war will be robotic. Um, Paul Schar, who's at the Center for New American Security, says, the rise of artificial intelligence will transform warfare and equates autonomy with the next industrial revolution. Um, in my own personal research, where I've tried to understand the motivations of development of unmanned technologies, I see the same sort of discussions about the inevitability. Um, there was a 2015 interview with the Deputy Chief of Naval Operations for Warfare Systems, and he was talking about the unmanned combat air system, which is um, something that kind of looks like a big stealth fighter, but it's unmanned and it lands on, um, on aircraft carriers. Looks super cool, but they've made like a handful of them, and they have no mission for them. Um, so the Admiral says, I am a firm believer that we need unmanned aircraft in our fleet, and it will make the air wing that much better. I don't know how, but I know it will. Um, but this is really interesting, because despite the fact that we have this vocabulary of inevitability, and this is the future of warfare, we have yet to articulate how unmanned systems translate into a theory of victory. How do we win wars with unmanned systems? Um, and this is where we get to what is the future role of these technologies. So quite often, unmanned systems are talked about as if they are a capability in themselves. It's a capability to be unmanned. But the reality is that unmanned is a characteristic that may create different types of capabilities that make different types of missions more or less effective. So for instance, we often talk about cost as being one of the major assets of unmanned systems. But unfortunately, the way the Department of Defense has been developing unmanned systems, quite often these are actually more expensive to operate than the manned systems. That's for a variety of reasons. First, most of the systems, though, the unmanned systems that we use are not unmanned. They're remotely piloted, which means that there's still a pilot, there's still a maintenance crew, there's still a whole logistical chain that's sitting not in particularly the combat theater, but still exists. So the cost for manpower is still the same. Meanwhile, the systems that they're creating are also highly technical, which means that they're also very expensive. The Global Hawk, for example, which is the um, intelligence surveillance and reconnaissance replacement to the U-2, uh, was supposed to be you know, a, a great cost saving, but it actually costs much more than the U-2, which is a 1960s aircraft. Um, and at least in the first block, the sensors were actually not as good as the 1960s aircraft, the U-2. Um, and so now you've got this you know, billion dollar aircraft, and you're supposed to be able to fly these into high-risk situations because you don't have a person in it, but you only have a few of them and they're really expensive. So you treat it the exact same way as you do the manned asset. So we have to think about the, the kind of the trade-offs that we have for unmanned systems. So what I found in my research is one of the primary reasons that people want to invest in unmanned systems is because it mitigates risk. In fact, I performed a survey of uh, the U.S. domestic uh, audience to understand when they preferred manned systems and unmanned systems in a series of different missions. And what we found was that quite often they're ambivalent between manned and unmanned, except when there is potential risk to the pilot. When I tell people that they're in a scenario where there's potential risk to the pilot, then they're willing to give up extraordinary amounts of mission effectiveness in order to mitigate the risk to that pilot. Um, in fact, the majority of our sample was willing to give up 50% mission effectiveness in order to save the life of that pilot or at least mitigate the risk to that pilot. Um, and we went on to ask them, well, would you give up 75% effectiveness? Would you give up 100% effectiveness? Um, and found that still a significant amount of individuals were willing to give up complete effectiveness in order to mitigate risk. So this is really interesting, because um, in political science, we have a theory that democracies don't opt into conflict very often, because they're worried about public opinion. But when they do opt into conflict, they go big and they win. But what we're finding with unmanned systems is that potentially that's changed. And because of the ability to mitigate risk to the pilot or types of individuals, that democracies might actually be opting into more conflicts, but be less likely to win them because they don't have the, um, the will to invest in kind of risky uh, missions. So um, it's really interesting to watch where unmanned technologies are going to go, 
but it's not just about, and I hope what you take from my talk is it's not just about the evolution of technology, because there is no evolution of technology. Technology has no agency in itself. Uh, human beings make decisions about the types of technologies that they develop. And so now what I hope we discuss um, in the Q&A are questions about does this mean that we're going to see states like the United States opt into conflict more often? Does it mean that states like the United States are going to invest in weapons that don't necessarily increase military effectiveness, but that mitigate risk? Does this, what implications does this have for crisis escalation? Um, and finally, as we tackle these questions, should we be making more autonomous weapon systems? Um, and what should we be thinking about when we um, develop these strategies that focus very heavily on the development of unmanned as a capability? Well, I think we can all agree that that was a terrific and really rich set of presentations. I had said that I wasn't going to ask any follow-on questions, but I may actually violate my own rule because it was all so, so fascinating. Um, something that seemed to come across um, in all three talks um, was that to a certain extent, one could view the US as being somewhat hampered in some of these domains of competition, whether it's information warfare or, for example, um, certain investments or applications of artificial intelligence because of its liberal mm -hmm. democratic nature, whereas our, author whereas our authoritarian rivals, whether it be China or Russia, I believe Vladimir Putin has said that whoever leads in the domain of AI will lead the world. Um, we fear that they may suffer from uh, less ethical qualms and be willing to cross boundaries that we may not cross. To what extent is that a, a concern for you? And, and I think any of you could... Um, so this is something um, we think about a lot because I do a lot of work in cyberspace. And quite often when we talk about the United States' um, competition in cyberspace, we complain because the United States believes in the open sharing of information, it believes in decentralized capitalist economies, and because of that, that means we're much more vulnerable than our kind of closed off competitors like China or Russia. Um, but I argue that this debate's not new. This is a debate that we had during the Cold War, where we often looked at the centralized economy in the Soviet Union and their ability to control the production of weapon systems and their production of um, the use of kind of people as, yeah. as a weapon. Um, we thought of that as being potentially disadvantageous to the United States. But in the long run, that actually ended up being the United States' advantage. And so I think that we should accept that the free flow of information and some of these um, ethical boundaries that we put on ourselves actually as an advantage to our overall economy and society, and then find where our true advantages are. For example, our people, our ability to generate new ideas, our ability to be flexible, these are things that our adversaries probably are not advantageous at. Mm -hmm. Great. Do I have you anything to add? Oh, yeah. Um, <laughs> a lot of sandals. Okay, so a lot of people in the U.S. national security establishment are very concerned about what Russia and China are doing for their space capabilities. And they say, look, you know, we treated space as a sanctuary. We kind of looked at it as something we agreed we wouldn't really interfere with. And look at what they've done over the past couple of years. We held on to our end of our unassumed, but you know, unspoken but bargain, they wouldn't do it and look, they're developing these weapons capabilities, so therefore we need to develop it as well. And to that, I'm always like, look, the United States has, we had an ASAP program during the Cold War. We tested anti-satellite weapons. We tested them. We just stopped because we got ahead and we figured it wasn't to our benefit to do it anymore. Um, and so I think, and that's why during my, my presentation, I talked about U.S. capabilities because I think people tend to look at Russia's and China's capabilities in kind of a vacuum. They don't recognize that what they're doing, they're improving and they're developing technological capabilities, but they're getting to the point where we already are and have been for some time. Now, is that destabilizing? We can have a whole discussion about that. But I think by the mere fact of them developing those capabilities does not necessarily mean anything, because why did we develop them? Because we thought it was important for national security. So it stands to reason that they're going to think the same thing. And just one other thing, I think we tend to look at things in the United States as everything people do is directed at us, you know, for our benefit and for our consumption. It's like, well, maybe they have domestic constituencies they want to deal with as well. Yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm glad Jacqueline made the comment about uh, risk. 
because that, you know, democracies go, go big or, or nothing, right? So go big or go home. I say if we're talking about go big or go home in the spectrum, we're going home um, because we don't have anything in between standing back or full-scale war. And they also, Russia and China, also take advantage of the fact that we are risk averse. I mean, I mean, even Obama said, do I want to have a nuclear war over Crimea? No. So they know that we are, are calibrating in that way, and that's precisely why they act in the gray zone, and they use these electric, electronic magnetic spectrum operations. Even after a year, I still get tongue-tied saying it. Um, because there's low attribution and because it's not enough for us to respond to militarily. So I think um, what Jacqueline was saying before is that you know, we want to preserve um, the risk. I mean, I think they see that as an inherent weakness in the US. Um, and, they're, and they're exploiting it 100%. Yeah. Great, OK. Do we have any questions, perhaps? Great. So I might take two or three at a time. So first of all, the gentleman back there. Our uh, big tech companies, uh, you know, uh, uh, like uh, I'm, I'm thinking mostly of Facebook, you know, Twitter and uh, Google, um, and, you know, to increase their profits, you know, they operate internationally and I guess they go into countries like, uh, like we're talking about here, right? And uh, do we provide them with the platform to uh, come back at us and, you know, for a, for a future warfare type of scenario with, uh, with those platforms? That's a, that's a very good and timely question. And I'd be with one question just behind. Uh, yes. We have sometimes have the risk of trying to recover those drones because they have technologies mm -hmm. that uh, we don't want the uh, adversaries to have. So we have to send in special forces, yeah. say, to recover these uh, drones because they have technologies. Uh, there were some, case, some cases, I think it was Iran or Iraq, they recovered some drones and they got some technology that we didn't want them to have. Uh, and, you know, that, that brings up risk to humans sending our troops in to try to prevent that from happening. Mm -hmm. what, what can we, you know, what's the, the risk and uh, mitigation to try to prevent that? Great. So, I don't need the mic, but, um, right, so. so as a follow-up to the other question, you know, I, I think um, when, you're, when we're looking at, you know, Facebook being accessible internationally without even necessarily having to be deployed within domestic networks like within China, China doesn't have Facebook. Um, another, another thing that concerned, another, another thing that I would like to ask is about the balance of responsibility for protecting um, U.S. domestic networks like critical infrastructure who, uh, when these networks face sophisticated state actors uh, or, or levels, of, uh, levels of sophistication akin to state actors, to what extent do they own the responsibility to what extent does the U.S. government or the military own responsibility for protecting U.S. critical infrastructure, and what what are the opportunities for partnership between the two parties? Terrific set of questions. So, on our own social media platforms being used against us, how to respond. Uh, when critical information infrastructure gets attacked and the risks involved with um, operating very high-end technology that we don't want to fall into enemy hands. Well, um, so we actually work on this critical infrastructure problem a lot at the Naval War College. So this is, um, this is a, a prickly issue. Um, I'm going to start with the most prickly part of the issue, which is how you define critical infrastructure. According to the Department of Homeland Security, there are 16 critical infrastructure sectors. That did not include elections. So um, depending on which kind of version of the website you look at, there may not be 17. Now within that 17 critical infrastructure sectors, there are sectors that you can imagine um, really logically fit. Energy, uh, water, but there's also commercial facilities. They had to have a section for Sony because Sony didn't fit. So as you start looking at these sectors, you realize that this is kind of anything and everything. And some of these are huge multinational corporations and some of them are kind of like mom and pops that are you know, running this out of their like server in their, their back room. So this is a really big problem. I think one of the biggest things that U.S. policy could do to solve this problem is to do a better job of defining what really is critical infrastructure um, and what really constitutes significant events. Um, so right now, the Department of Defense um, is not the lead on defending critical infrastructure networks. <laughs> the lead is actually the Department of Homeland Security, kind of, 
Um, but there's also the role that the FBI plays if it's a crime issue. So depending on kind of if it's criminal or terrorist, um, de delineates who has the primary role. And then right now, the Department of Defense is kind of the last in line. Um, and now's where I want to say my disclaimer that everything I'm saying um, is my own um, opinions and not those of the Naval War College, the Department of Defense, or the US Navy, because I'm going to go on the critique. Um, the Department of Defense, and spe specifically Cyber Command, really wants to be the big defender of critical infrastructure. Um, so they have these what are called Cyber National Mission Force teams. And these teams um, are they're trying to decide, these cyber protection teams, what role do they have in defending the critical networks. Well, we have a law called Posse Comitatus, um, which was passed in the 1800s, which means that the US can't send the US military to defend civilian um, resources. That's why we use the National Guard. So some of the CPTs, the cyber protection teams, are National Guard teams. Um, but they're struggling to find what the real role for them is. My research finds that the Department of Defense should focus mostly on what I would call counter cyber operations. So trying to degrade um, big nation states' ability to launch large scale attacks. But the actual day to day defense of these networks probably needs to continue to reside with where the expertise is, which is in the private sector. Um, and that we need to do a better job of linking up the private sector with government organizations like Department of Homeland Security, which is increasingly being the information and intelligence kind of safe hold um, to do better integration because for these um, these different corporations they're not always getting the big picture so this is a large-scale cyber campaign maybe they don't realize that because they're just looking at their one piece so this is a really complicated question I've spent too much time answering it um, but um, my hope is that the Department of Defense maybe focuses a little bit more on kind of the strategic level um, and we let the Department of Homeland Security work on partnering with private enterprise to do more of the intelligence sharing and emergency management work. Great. Does anyone else want to react or respond to the questions? In regards to the U.S., uh, the critical infrastructure, you didn't ask about space, but I'm going to talk about it. Um, <laughs> because there is that element for that as well. Um, it used to be, as I said before, you had commercial, you had military, you had civil space assets, and never the twain shall meet. But now, you know, you have um, stuffing a, a NASA payload being launched on the U.S. national security payload. How do you define that? Is that a civil program? Is that a national security program? 80% uh, of the U.S. military communications are carried over commercial satellites. So if you're trying to look at, okay, we need to make sure resiliency of our military <coughs> communication structure, does that mean the U.S. military has to protect those commercial satellites? Guess what? A lot of those commercial satellites are not U.S. in origin. And so it says, okay, how do we do these international uh, protections? So it's really difficult to figure out where our critical infrastructure um, begins and ends. And one of the things the U.S. military is looking at as well is just diversifying its capabilities and diversifying inputs because much as we would like to, I think we cannot do it alone anymore. The, um, space is inherently international. And with all the new um, companies and new space actors coming on board, um, it would be foolish not to take advantage of those capabilities. But then again, when the military starts depending on those capabilities, how do you make sure they're there over the long term? So it's, it's a difficult question to answer. I'll just add one more thing. I think, too, when we talk about military competition, we usually view it through this conventional lens. But the strategies of Russia and China are just to probe where weakness is. And that means in our bank accounts, that means on social media. So I think we're used to seeing a competition between two nation states as kind of, you know, not as dynamic as it's become. So it does make it very difficult to kind of respond to this full spectrum, um, anything from a conventional conflict to these social media campaigns to, you know, cyber attacks uh, from the private and the public sphere. Um, so if we want to talk about the disadvantages of being in a liberal democracy, I mean, with Russia has their hands in most major corporations, right? So they have some control over that. Um, and of course, they have more centralized power. Of course, that also comes with a lot of disadvantages. Mm -hmm. um, but it is just another way to kind of view this, this kind of emerging competition, which is very dynamic between us and our adversaries. And I wanted to get back to the drone question really quickly. Yes. Um, 
the, the risk problem is a big problem. I think one of the primary advantages that drones potentially have in the future is if they can be low cost. Mm -hmm. And so I think if, if we're viewing drones as a way to solve a risk problem, we need to go into it with an idea that we're willing to lose them, which means you need to develop them in kind of a low cost, maybe a commercial off the shelf technology kind of way. Okay, do we have any more questions? Yes, we have two questions up here, Teresa. Mike's on its way. Thank you. I just came back from a conference in Camden, Maine, and learned about the use of treaties in the past. And there used to be, I gather, hundreds every year that were where some were bilateral, some were multilateral, but with the authoritarian, it's sort of a way to, um, uh, it's a defense mechanism, it's not an offense mechanism really. And, um, and yeah, they were saying that there used to be hundreds a year, then under Obama it got down to about um, 10 a year, and now there's none under Trump. And I wanted to ask you if, all, if you think Treat. that these are treaties that oh, are sort of, it, it, how do you, the, I think you, Victoria spoke about it, the rules of the road in space, the rules of the road with drones, the rules of the road that are international rules that aren't happening anymore. Okay. So my question, it's mostly a fiscal question, is there a lot of concrete um, research and evidence to prove that unmanned technologies, um, or not really to prove, but that just kind of state the differences between, you know, let's say, like, I'm a C-130 um, aircraft mechanic down at Quonset. What does it cost to maintain a C-130 versus a unmanned aircraft? And what's the manning power like? I know it might take five of us from the fuel back shop and another 10 crew chiefs to get that plane up and running, but yeah. does it only take five to get an unmanned aircraft up and running? That's a very good question. Um, any other questions? Oh, yes, question there. Um, so my question is, uh, what can be done about the vulnerability that is the interdependency of our domains? So, you know, space being dependent on cyber and cyber kind of being dependent on EMS. Make the EMS a domain. <laughs> um, great. So the vulnerabilities posed by domain interdependency, uh, whether, let's say, the Trump administration's different approach to multilateralism uh, makes managing these contested spaces more difficult and um, cost benchmarking basically mm -hmm. between manned yeah. and unmanned platforms. So. I can go first. Um, okay, so for space, there are five major treaties. Uh, they were um, basically argued, be or they were signed between 1967 and 1975, and that's it. There have been no real treaties on space since then. Um, and so there are a lot of people who argue the foundational um, legal um, doctrine for space is the Outer Space Treaty, which dates 1967. And so uh, when I go to space events, there's a lot of discussions, you know, is the Outer Space Treaty still relevant? There's so many gray areas. Obviously, there are things happening 50 years ago, or 50, that now that 50 years ago, they had no idea what would even be there. Do we need to redo the Outer Space Treaty? My argument is no. I think it's, it's got solid doctrines and solid ideas. Um, but a lot of people look at that as a weakness, that there have not been any new treaties in the interim. Uh, the problem is it's difficult to get a treaty going, and it's difficult to argue one. And with space changing so rapidly, you could spend years, possibly decades, hammering out a treaty, and it would be out of date by the time you do it. Mm -hmm. um, the UN system is split in two how they deal with space. You have the Committee on Peaceful Uses of Outer Space that does civil space, and you have the Conference on Disarmament that does security space. The Conference on Disarmament is a consensus built organization, which means they have to agree on the agenda in order to discuss things. They have not been able to agree on an agenda since like 1994. So nothing's happening in Geneva. Uh, we have a security conference there every year. We're like, guys, maybe this will be the year. You know, this could be it, but it hasn't happened yet. Um, so that's an issue, because if we're talking about security space stuff, we're going to talk about it. Um, the Committee on Peaceful Uses of Outer Space, the civil space part of the UN, um, they're very sensitive. They're like, hey, we're not, we're not security. We do civil. We don't do that. That's changing a little bit. 
But um, for example, the past couple years, since 2010, they've been working on long-term sustainability guidelines. Um, this is a bottom-up approach where, again, it's a consensus build organization. I think there's like 87 countries in COPUS where they, uh, you know, they say, okay, we're going to agree what are the best practices of various aspects to make sure that the space is sustainable over the long term. Now, they started it in 2010. They have, they just finished this past session in February, uh, 21, 21 guidelines. And they're going to finish up, the, the, the mandate is to finish by the June plenary meeting, and that's it. And these are kind of, you know, they say, okay, in eight years they've gotten 21 guidelines. I mean, that's, uh, you know, so they argue that's not even treated, there's not legally binding. But I think, that, I think it's helpful. I think it's the way things are going now because just the way the political environment is, it's very hard to get treaties to move ahead. And my argument is, well, do you want to be right or do you want to accomplish something? If you want to accomplish something, focus on norms of behavior. Um, you know, for example, in the CD, um, Russia and China have been pushing for um, a treaty basically pre preventing the placement of weapons in outer space. And the United States like, oh, we are not going to discuss that because basically it's geared towards us. You know, we're not going to agree to it. This is stupid. Um, and that's really the only legal treaty that's been discussed over the past couple decades. But under the current administration, there's been a push for commercial um, entities to lead the way for discussing best practices and norms of behavior. And for space, that almost makes sense because a lot of times the new space actors, the commercial actors, there are uh, light years, haha, -ha, ahead of what the U.S. military, U.S. government's doing in terms of space capabilities. And so you're saying, well, these are the operators, the ones actually doing things in space now. It makes sense that they kind of know what's worked out. Uh, the concern, of course, with doing norms of behavior or best practices, oftentimes you get what's easiest to agree to, maybe not necessarily what's the most important thing to agree to. But my argument is that as you start with one agreement, you start with a yes and you go from there. So. Yeah, so the trees thing is really important, especially now in an increasing multipolar world. I mean, China and Russia's MO is to subvert the order. So it's important that we establish what that is. Um, before, I mean, establish the rules before uh, people start breaking them. And one problem we have with this is, of course, I mean, they're just more forward leaning. And we have US Army Europe people um, saying we're jammed every day by Russia. You know, they wake up in the morning, they make a cup of coffee, and they turn their jammer on because they know we're in the area. <coughs> and we don't jam back because we're considering jamming to be escalatory, um, even though it's kind of below the threshold of conflict. Um, so, establishing you know what is an act of war in this kind of gray area and on the spectrum is extremely important um, to make sure that you're setting the right example and also too then you can start pointing the finger obviously when someone is is doing that um, just to answer this gentleman's question over here every single joint war fighting capability happens in the electromagnetic spectrum every single one so um, from Intel to C2 to fires, every single one depends on having access to the spectrum. Um, so that would, calling the EMS the domain would be an excellent way to assist in joint war fighting capabilities as well. Okay, right, we have time for some more questions. Sir. Yeah, I've got a question, uh, it's a little different as uh, it doesn't deal directly with two different adversarial uh, uh, positions. But as we build more intelligence into our computers and our weapon systems, okay, uh, is there any consideration being given to our systems becoming uh, completely autonomous, okay, where we can't control them? So now we've got something that we've put out there that we're not in complete control of. Mm -hmm. Possible cyber activity, hacking, or whatever from some adversary could now turn this weapon thing against us. You know, at some point, computer systems are going to become as intelligent as us. Maybe even incorporating our sensory, you know, all our capabilities, they'll be built into computers. Any consideration being given to how we would handle something like that? Yes, I'd say there's a good deal of consideration. Um, are, there any, are there any other questions? Or should we, should I let Jackie and others tackle? Ah, Jennifer, here. Yeah. So I want to build off what Whitney was talking about. So 
You're talking about various joint functions like fires and maneuver is a really interesting one and when we think about cyberspace or the EMS, thinking about how you, you maneuver and take these kind of joint functions that are and apply them to cyberspace or the EMS is quite difficult because you don't, we don't, there's not one cyberspace, there's lots of different cyberspaces that are controlled by lots of different actors. And then within the EMS, there's spectrum allocation issues. So I'm wondering, what do you think about maneuvers in the cyberspace or the EMS? Can it actually be applied? And if it can be, how? That's also a great question, but I might be biased because she's my wife. But. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Yeah, I actually hate the term maneuver in, when applied to many of these domains. Um, I think a lot of these virtual domains, we look for analogies in conventional warfighting, especially in very physical warfighting domains, in order to, to help us understand what seems really uncertain and hard to grasp. Some of these analogies are useful because they help us make sense of what is really difficult. And some of them are counterproductive. I find maneuver to be actually one of the ones that's slightly counterproductive. Because I don't, I, I think maybe there are words that we could use that are in like logistics doctrine, for example, that, that might be more useful. Um, I don't have a good alternative to use besides maneuver, but I don't like maneuver. So I'm with you on that one, uh, with no good solution. Um, I also want to talk about this um, idea of complete autonomy because um, this is a huge debate. Like how t autonomous do we want our weapon systems? So earlier I talked about air-to-air -air missiles, um, and this is where my spouse is probably going to call me out. Um, so air-to-air -air missiles are increasingly autonomous. So you can launch them at increasingly longer ranges, and then the missile has its own seeker head. So that seeker head can look within its field of view and using the logics that are already inside the weapon system, figure out what weapon it wants to target. So we've had problems with some of these types of weapons, whether they're air-to-air -air missiles, whether they're um, anti-surface missiles, whether they're surface-to-air missiles, because sometimes the logics that are built into the seeker head aren't smart enough to understand what's a good guy and what's a bad guy. So, I mean, there's actual radio calls that pilots have to make when they launch and they're not sure if the seeker head has the right target or not. Um, and there were um, autonomous um, missiles that the Navy used to use that had that autonomous seeking capability that they actually stopped using because the surface area that the um, seeker had got to was so large and indiscriminate that the original controller was unable to know whether they would be uh, targeting friendlies or targeting bad guys. So this is a really important discussion and one that I think in the Department of Defense, both policy-wise and technology-wise, they haven't figured out what the answer is. Um, and then finally, I want to get back to the C-130 the C question about um, the difference in cost. Um, so there are a few studies where they've looked at this in kind of very specific platforms. And where you get the real um, cost savings is when you take the man out of the loop. Because if we're talking about, for example, I mean, the U-2 is a really good one, the U-2 versus the Global Hawk. Um, you know, there's still people that are controlling the sensors for the Global Hawk in another place. So you have a back end that you're paying for in the same way that you pay for the U-2. And in fact, sometimes if you're using an unmanned system beyond visual range and so you're having to hook onto a satellite infrastructure, the cost of maintaining that satellite infrastructure is actually really high too. So that's a high cost. But then also, if you're not putting people overseas, that's a cost too. So it ends up being like a kind of complicated um, question. Um, so the bottom line is there's no clear winner. So, but that actually cuts some of the narrative right now, which says that unmanned is always cheaper, which is not necessarily the case. Me, okay. Um, so the, for the maneuver question, I guess I'll just use an example, because you're right, maneuver can just be kind of a, a crap buzzword. Um, but what I really mean to say is, like I was talking about before, about how Russia and China conceptualize information and how we view it, right, in these kind of compartmentalized areas. You have SIGINT here and EW here, and a lot of times they're divorced, uh, and especially that's been a problem for U.S. Army Europe, um, to cyber, to C2. So I guess what I, what I mean to say is maneuver is to be able to communicate uh, seamlessly, okay? So SIGIN has a picture, okay? Are we going to send a missile or can we do cyber effects? Okay, we're gonna jam an incoming missile. Are we also jamming our other capability over there or is that the enemy? 
what decoys do we have available to kind of deter a missile competition or, or convince an adversary that they need to use too many missiles so they're going to be deterred from trying to attack us? And does the person who have the operational picture of what's going on on the ground have communication links between everyone making all those decisions? So that's what I mean to say is maneuver, is can we use this whole, all of these kind of tools in the information space, and can those people communicate and have battle management to understand what's going on, where and how, and to kind of put in the best effects that we have in real time? We'll see. Hmm. Yeah. Um, so one thing I noticed is that both of you place a huge amount of emphasis on um, enhancing our communication network and uh, preserving the ability to fight in a, in a communication-rich environment, but to what extent should the U.S. military also focus on fighting dark and oh fighting within a yes. communication-denied environment? Yes. <laughs> I think um, too often we hear the word maneuver and not enough we hear the word resilience. Um, and resilience is not like, uh, I often hear when we talk resilience, say we're going to harden our networks which is kind of like using a cyber defense magic pixie dust. Um, because there's no like um, special gel that like hardens your networks. It's a much more complicated problem with a lot of different trade-offs. And so learning to operate, even when we don't have the digital capabilities, it's really important. I like to think about it um, like uh, new cars. So older cars, if you didn't have um, some of the sensors, it was fine, right? Like you just used your, you, you just, use like some sort of manual indicator. Now if my like super complicated car has a computer problem that looks to me cosmetic, I have to pay thousands of dollars because that computer problem is, is set up with like the way the whole car functions. So that becomes like a, a binary vulnerability. You either work or you don't work. It doesn't just degrade. And we need to think about building communication systems and building tactics and techniques of warfare that have kind of this um, degradation along a spectrum instead of this, if it does not work, we can't function at all. I'll talk about it in an aspect of uh, surviving. I mean, with, with the proliferation, I mentioned before that China and Russia now have these long range sensors. Uh, that they didn't have before. Now we have over the horizon radar. We now have, you know, s satellites that with very high fidelity. Um, so what we're used to doing, I mean, in Iraq, you would set, set up a, a C210 and it would em emit, I mean, it would just emit all these signals. I mean, if you put that tent, you know, in Eastern Europe tomorrow in a conflict with Russia, it would last less than 30 minutes. You know, it's just this big target. It's emitting all this energy. So um, we are making um, our ability to operate in the spectrum more resilient, but we also have to acknowledge that we're never going to go back to the way it was. Even if we achieve superiority in the spectrum, there will be times when we do not have superiority. We'll still be vulnerable to being seen because we are emitting so much. Um, so that is being, you know, considered uh, a lot now. I mean, decentralizing, especially in the Army, they're working a lot on decentralizing, um, not being able to communicate for days at a time, and how do you improvise um, uh, and just operate completely differently because, again, we're never going to go back to this scenario where you can hide. And because of proliferation of all these technologies, it's going to be almost nearly impossible to hide. So now just changing how we operate. How do you move very quickly and how do you communicate without emitting too much to attract the adversary? So it is uh, very much changing the way the military is thinking about operating. Yeah. I mean, I think it's a real concern for the U.S. military is how you deal. We're so used to having dependable access to our space capabilities. What do we do if it's not there? <clears throat> a lot of it depends on what that space asset is. Um, sometimes it's just going to be kind of annoying. You know, GPS, there are over 30, I think we only need 24 satellites for the constellation to work properly. Uh, there are like 30 or 33 on orbit. So even if one were taken out, it might mean that, okay, you're not going to triangulate your position as quickly as you might like. But, you know, you're not going to be able to not be able to completely use that capability. Um, but if it's one of your exquisite billion dollar national security satellites that you depend upon to see if the Soviet, Russia, um, Soviet, the then Soviet, now Russian missiles are coming over the pole, uh, that can be very destabilizing and unthreatening. Um, there's a lot of military war games where they say, okay, what do we do if, you know, we lost this clear capability? And almost quickly they go nuclear 
because they say, well, we have to assume if we can't see what they're doing, we have to assume things are, have gotten very bad. Um, but that's changing a little bit um, because the acquisition for space capabilities are saying, look, we can no longer have a billion dollar target sitting there. A, it takes way too long to build. B, it's way too old. And C, we can't afford to lose it. So the idea is you want to disaggregate your capabilities, you want to spread them out, you want to have a quick response. If you lose a capability, you want to be able to get something up quickly. You want to have operational response. Um, so those are all the buzzwords right now, uh, but it's very difficult to strange. It's very difficult to change acquisition capabilities very quickly. Um, it's just we don't do that. Uh, that's not how the US military works. Uh, commercial sector does. Um, they get something up in 18 months to, to three years, it's fine. The US military can take a decade or so to get a satellite up. And that's just difficult to change um, because we've got this whole apparatus, bureaucratic and uh, legal, that's set up around the old wave acquisitions. But they're thinking about it. And one of the big things is just this past week, with the FY19 budget request that came out, and people in national security space were like, gasp, they're not going to do any more cyber satellites. Cyber satellites are meant to be doing early warning. Uh, they're the billion dollar satellites. And uh, Air Force is like, we can't afford to do this anymore. We want the capability, but we're going to have to have it spread out over a bunch of satellites because we just can't think that way anymore. So I think it's really a sea change in how they think about space and how they think about acquisitions, whether or not they can actually carry it out. Or it's four years now they're going to change the buzzwords. It's just be another way of thinking. It's hard to say. Great. We have all time for one or two final questions. Oh, I have a question up here. I go back to unmanned technologies. Okay. Uh, it's just so intriguing to me because I'm Air Force myself. Uh, what is the capability in unmanned technologies for um, low-level observable technology? Are we there yet, or are we not quite there like we are with manned aircraft? Okay. Any other questions? Okay. Well, then I have one final question of my. <laughs> Sorry. Sorry, I didn't see you. Um, I actually have two questions. Oh, if that, great. If that's allowed, if that's allowed. Yes, yes, it is. Uh, my I'm first question is that, Jackie, you talked a little bit about how democracies are reluctant to enter into conflicts because they're concerned about public opinion and that unmanned systems could reduce this concern, leading us into more conflict. It seems like modern warfare is going to be really expensive. And the cost of warfare also generate negative public opinion in the same way that the loss of human life would. I think she, she must work at like a really great institution. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> this time I work with Jackie. <laughs> um, and then my second question is, Whitney, you mentioned that the U.S. has lost escalation dominance in the electromagnetic spectrum. What are some ways that we can get it back? And then also, the consideration about, as a liberal democracy, are we hampered? That we've just discussed this a little bit, and then is that sort of a false dichotomy with escalation dominance back in a place like the gray zone. Great. So I have one final question of my own, which is, um, what is the most ridiculous depiction of future warfare that you can think of <laughs> in, in a movie or a TV show? Uh, so, there we go. Oh. And I think we'll end there after that. Okay. Um, so the low ops, low level, uh, the observe. Uh, oh my God, my words. Um, so, you know, it depends on how you detect, right? So, um, we definitely can create drones that are stealthy. This is, we're already doing that. But when I use the word stealth, what I mean is the ability to evade radars. Increasingly, detection is not just about radar sensors. It's about passive detection. And passive detection is using sensors that collect along the electromagnetic spectrum. Um, and these uh, unmanned systems, especially if they are not autonomous and they're talking back, they are necessarily emitting within the electromagnetic spectrum because they have to communicate back in order to get GPS, in order to get um, any sort of control. And so if those two things are happening, if they need some sort of kind of satellite navigation or they need to communicate back, they're going to be loud in other ways. So that's going to be, um, that's going to be a trade-off for unmanned systems if they're not completely autonomous. In terms of the um, expense and cost, this I, I think if, if you could take one word out of this panel, it should be about cost, because that seems to be what the competition is about. And this idea of whether
of how we define cost. Is cost about the loss of human lives? Is cost about the actual cost to acquire and build a system? Um, is cost about the ability to sustain an operation long term? These are really important for escalation dynamics. And um, I, I want to recommend um, some research that's being done at Stanford University with Amy Ziegert, who is doing experimental work to try and understand how people conceptualize costly signaling and unmanned systems. Um, because potentially, it's kind of been turned on its head. Um, I like to think of this as the, the price is right dilemma. So, we, we all as states have some sort of value that we attach to foreign policy objectives. Um, and our adversaries may or may not know what this value is. But what they're trying to do with these technologies is to kind of bid below the value. Because if you go over, then you end up at war with the United States and you're screwed. Um, so what information operations, electromagnetic jamming, space, operations, unmanned systems are trying to get these states to do is to be able to bid a dollar, right? So this is their, their, their chance to try and influence United States actions without tripping and going over. Um, and cost is pivotal to that, that dynamic. So there's a few things. Um, well, there's a lot of things, actually, so I'm going to try and just say a few of them um, in ways that we can respond in the electromagnetic uh, spectrum. I mean, one thing is get comfortable with jamming, and we're really not comfortable with jamming. Um, so again, meeting them where they are. I mean, there's also um, the future of directed energy. So using directed energy or, or other non-RF parts of the spectrum um, to render a target uh, ineffective without causing human casualties. So you can, you know, use directed energy to make a boat engine stop, but you have not killed anyone on the boat, right? You can use directed energy to fizzle um, the radar on a missile defense. You have not killed anyone. You have not blown anything up. There's no collateral effects, but you have then made this asset no longer useful. Um, we're still far, far away -ish from um, having that operational at multiple levels, but it is um, something that we're looking into. And another thing is uh, decoys. And decoys would really help with this kind of salvo competition. Um, so if you're using decoys, you might convince an enemy or you know, change their operational picture to assume that you have more targets than they have missiles. Therefore, they might be deterred into hitting you if they don't think they have enough missiles to take out all your targets. Therefore, you've deterred them. Um, and there's also a lot of future and multifunction EW and comms and cognitive EW that really make us more dynamic when applying to, okay, we're being jammed. Okay, well, I have a multifunction system that can just jump frequencies until I can operate. Um, so there's a lot of, a lot of um, not, not only, you know, concept of operations, but technologies that will, you know, help us there. And, I mean, directed energy is an expensive investment, but things like multifunction EW and comms are, are not at all. So those are really easy ways that we can be more dynamic. Okay. Uh, this isn't directed towards me, but the idea of the cost of warfare be making it more limited, I don't see that happening. It hasn't happened yet. We just dump the cost of overseas operations into contingency funds. We don't have to have a separate discussion about it. We're getting, that's going to continue over the long term. We're doing over a decade. So, I don't know about that. Um, but in regards to the most ridiculous depiction of, of, oh, yeah. for space, um, yeah. where to begin? I, I, I'm a political scientist. I'm not even a real scientist. And even I'm like, oh my God, even I know that's not right. Um, first of all, anything that does human space flight, the radiation is going to kill you. Okay? Um, the idea of getting people to Mars, whether or not we can get to Mars, they're not going to survive the trip. The radiation is going to kill them. Um, so that's always a big question mark in my mind when we talk about this sort of thing. In the movie The Martian, um, I went to an event where the deputy head of NASA was there and he was asked what he thought about the movie. He's like, I really wish they'd shown how they landed because we can't figure it out. Um, <laughs> Uh, the movie uh, Gravity, which I mentioned, I don't know if you guys remember it, but you have Sandra Bullock basically using a jetpack to go amongst tremendous changes in Delta V, you know, from one orbit to another. Like, rockets can't even do that. And she's in her little jetpack just going around like that. Some people in the space world are very upset about that movie. They think, you know, it's bad. I'm like, well, guys, you know, some LT will get a vocabulary of what's happening. Um, and then the movie Wally, if you guys remember that, you know, the, you talk about debris on orbit. That's what everyone thinks. You're going to be able to 
at a certain point, the trash is going to get so bad, you have to pop on through a layer. I mean, that's not what we're talking about when we talk about space debris. We talk about at some point, there's going to be so many objects of trash or it's debris on orbit, it's going to become financially prohibitive for us to do what we want to do, but it's never like we're going to be hemmed in. Um, and uh, finally, the one thing I think we just see in common, um, any kind of Hollywood movie, whenever anyone wants a thing, they just call up the NSA and they, they, oh they God, do a yeah. satellite that's going to look right then and there. Oh you know, they God. call it on the radio. Like you know, when the satellite, the EO satellite is like tracking there. Like, yeah, exactly. Uh, you know, it happens all the time. All of, that's not how satellites work. That's not how intelligence works. That's not how any of that works. But, you know, it's a good plot device. I can see why they do that. So. I need to watch more movies. I'll let Victoria take. I know. I, mean, I, think, I think the last movie I watched was like Moana. I've got small kids. <laughs> I do think the ease in which things look like they get done, like there's a problem, someone calls someone with a bunch of big screens in front of them and they dial you know, one number and somehow it gets taken care of, which is obviously not the case. So. I think the uploading of the virus in Independence Day is a pretty bad <laughs> one as well. But. Okay, well on that note, um, please join me in thanking our panelists.